Good morning, Gateway. Just you stand? We're going to enter into a time of worship. This is a portion where, of our service where we use songs as a way to praise, glorify a God that we believe is alive. And he, the creator of the universe, is working in this room this morning. It's pretty exciting. You have been our dwelling place. You have been our dwelling place oh everlasting God before you form the mountain tops you were before it all and soon our lives turn back When the sun comes up, satisfy us, for the day has passed us by, for our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy us we
for our hearts give up spirit fill us satisfy us with your love for those of you who just walked in good morning good to see your smiling faces on this spring morning is it spring not really sure. It's probably going to snow next week. I saw uh, a chart that had all the seasons of Virginia, and there's about um, four different springs intermixed with several different winters. I think we're in the middle of false spring right now, but let's hope it keeps warming up. And uh, we've got a beautiful day today, so let's, let us be thanks. Let us give thanks and be glad in the Lord that gave it to us. Why don't we do something? Let's, let's pass Christ's peace with one another. This is a tradition that happens all around the world that we get to take part in as believers, sharing a peace beyond understanding, a peace that we can only gain through Christ who satisfies us. So peace the Lord be with you. Why don't you turn to one another, share that peace, leave your seat if you must, meet somebody new. Let's wake each other up. If you're tuning in at home, shoot somebody a text that you're thinking about. future and for my 
So when I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And when I doubt it Remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas in the clay, and I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas in the clay. You made so all things work together. I'm the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay When I doubt it, will remind me How wonderful you made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay Oh 
born again to your family. Blood flows through veins. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no
came to my rescue and I want to be where you are as I call you answer and you came to my Father, thank you for seeing us in our present situation and asking us to come as we are. Thank you for ripping us from the miry clay, from whatever desert that we're in, that you never stop pursuing no matter how many times we fall or we fail, you never stop rescuing. Help us to sense that, to feel that, to hear that this morning to our very core. Bring us back to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Gateway. Why don't you go ahead and take a seat. Hi everyone, my name is Pete and I'd like to welcome you to Gateway this morning. Sundays are a chance where we can gather as a community, worship together, and connect with God. One thing we like to say around here is that you are not here by accident. We believe that God has something in store for each of us today. If you're new here, welcome. We're a church of people who come from many different backgrounds, and we are excited you joined us today. If you'd like to connect with us, we invite you to visit our website, mygateway.life, and fill out a Connect card. If you fill one out, Gateway donates $5 to one of our charity partners. Again, that's mygateway.life, and we can't wait to meet you. So thanks for being here this morning, and let's hear from the Lord today. Um. Public service announcement before we jump in. Um, thank you so much, those of you who joined us last week in, in uh, praying for Kids Town. And a special thanks to uh, quite a few of you who actually signed up to help us with Kids Town. Thank you for that very much. Um, we are still obviously not able to stand up our 9 o'clock service fully because we don't have uh, kids in the back. And really appreciate those families that are brave enough to... Uh, slug it out at 9 o'clock with us. So we're looking for several volunteers to help us at the 11 o'clock service with uh, kids, working with our kids, and and we need to stand the entire program up at 9 o'clock, so we need a full slate of volunteers and leadership. So um, continue to pray about that if you would, but thanks for praying this past week at 1014, several of you. Um, This, by the way, was, they did this last Sunday, they talked about uh, the early church and they made the point in Kidstown that the church is not a building, the church is people. This is just one of the many benefits you get with working with Kidstown. This is from a seven-year-old named Quinn. They made uh, little popsicle figures to demonstrate their church family and I want you to notice that the one in the middle was obviously the woman that was helping with Kids Town, her name is Gloria. Uh, the one on our left, that's, that's the little girl herself, Quinn. Notice Gloria's fancy hairdo, if you would, the little swirl. But I especially like the one on the far right, the bald guy, that's me. Uh, and one of the kids actually, <laughs> I wanted to get a picture from this family and they'd already thrown theirs away. But one of, the, one of the parents came up to me afterwards and showed me this and said, guess who that is? And I said, I don't know. He said, that's you, Pastor Ed. And my, my child said, uh, you were easy because you're bald, so they didn't have to draw any hair. Um, so this is one of the things you get when you work with children. All right, so uh, another public service announcement. We're doing a really special thing on Good Friday, the Friday before Easter. We're going to have a Seder experience. A Seder meal is the meal that uh, Jewish families have been participating in since the period of history that we're talking about in our current series, since the Exodus. 
They celebrate that. They explain it to their children through an elaborate, ritualized meal experience. And it's, it's fun, and it's dynamic, and it is a great education opportunity for children, especially, I'll say, children that are five and above. We'll be doing that on Good Friday here. Eat before you come. It will not be a full meal, but you will get to sample what they, uh, what they do and the, what they eat in the Seder experience. Chris uh, Levi and his wife Lisa have, uh, are coordinating this for us. And Chris, you've done this many times over the years. How did this start? How did, how did you get into this? Um, about 10 years ago, back at our previous church, before we started attending Gateway, I was in a small group. And we decided to, uh, we were all kind of curious about the Passover and, and that whole thing. So we just I started researching it. And, and prior to this, you didn't have this experience? Or, okay, none, yeah. none whatsoever. Okay. Uh, so I spent six or eight months, you know, reading books, uh, digging into the, the history, the, the liturgy of it and everything. And eventually we all came together and celebrated the Passover uh, and, and walked through each of the different steps and, and how everything... Tie, ties together. Um, well, what have you learned from doing this? Because you've done it quite a few times now, so what have you learned from doing this? We've done it several times. Um, the key thing that always jumps out at me every time we do this, and every time I prepare for doing this, is how much... Wait, let me interrupt. Mm -hmm. When you guys do this, and, and you've done it, most of the time you've done it in your home, right? That's and when, correct. Y'all go nuts. I mean, what, what do you do? Just we, real we go quickly. all out. Yeah. Um, well, we de-leaven the house, which <laughs> yes, is what just, you're supposed to which do. Which is it. like crazy. You, you would be surprised at how much common everyday things have leaven in them. I mean, it can go down to toothpaste for, uh, you know. Okay, so anyway, the Levi's are nuts. That's the parentheses. <laughs> All right, so what have you learned? So, uh, like I said, the big thing that always jumps out at me is one of the books I read on Passover as I was preparing, it was written by a Messianic Jew, and he, he mentions the... Messianic Jew is a Jewish person who's come to faith in Jesus. Come to faith they believe in Jesus he's the Messiah, Christ. son of God. That's right. Okay. He said, he, he, and he grew up Jewish, you know, in the traditional sense and before he came to Christ, and he, one of the phrases he used was how much unconscious worship there is in a uh, to Jesus in the Passover and the Passover takes place you know the original Passover takes place you know 1400 years uh, before Jesus before yeah. Jesus and how it foreshadows in that in the deliverance from Exodus how it foreshadows the eventual deliverance from sin uh, that Jesus Jesus did so so this will be Good Friday the yes. Friday before Easter we will start here at seven o'clock Yes. Come having eaten, but they will be able to sample the, the food. We will have a, a, a sample table where you can have little little pieces, and I mean little pieces <laughs> of what would traditionally be served at a much in a much more intimate setting. And, and it is a liturgical experience, a responsive experience, but it's a full immersive experience. Yes. It's, it's, mm -hmm. And we walk through the Passover, and they're going to learn some stuff. They're going to learn some stuff. it's great for kids of all ages. Uh, that's uh, correct. Five will, to ninety-five. There will actually be a portion in the ceremony where I will bring up some of the younger kids, and I will, uh, and there, and it's is, this is actually a part of the ceremony, and I will, I will have to bring up a few of the younger kids to walk through a certain piece of it. So. Okay, so we are going to need you to sign up because we need to know how many people are going to be here. We're going to set the room up. We'll be sitting at tables, so uh, there is. A sign up out in the lobby? That's correct. There's a sign up right here by the steps that lead up to the uh, uh, top floor. And you can also do it on mygateway.life. So Good Friday, Seder experience. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, the, obviously the Seder harkens back to, reminds us of, and teaches us about, keeps in our minds the, the, ish, the, the circumstances, the, 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 the journey that, that we're talking about in our current series. So today is the end of part one of our journey through the Old Testament book of Exodus that we have called Rescued. Now I told you, we're going to make our way through this whole book, and this is going to take us months. But we're going to take a little break for a few weeks, and then we'll come back to it in the summer. Um, we'll come back to the Rescued series, but we're ending today, uh, this is movie intermission. Uh, in today's passage, Moses has been in Midian. If you've been with us, you know this. He's been out 
tending sheep for his father-in-law Jethro. He spent 40 years out there. And today, he makes his way back to Egypt. This is a, a homecoming of sorts, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to ask Chris, if he would, to read uh, the passage of Scripture for us today. It is Exodus 4. It will be on your screen. And I'll have, uh, Mike is going to go back to several verses of Scripture as I'm walking us through it this morning. But if you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to look. It'll be easier for you. Uh, Exodus chapter 4. We'll be doing the back half of the chapter, chapter 17, uh, verses 17 through 31, Exodus 4. And I'm going to... I'm going to set up each paragraph that Chris reads for us this morning because uh, this is an interesting passage of Scripture and honestly a little bit strange in a couple of places, and you'll see. The, the, Moses has sewn together six kind of different pieces of cloth to, to build this part of the story, and he's done it quickly. He, there's not a lot of detail here. He's, he's taken us essentially from Midian back to Egypt and he doesn't want to spend a lot of time here because the real action is in Egypt. That's where the story is. So this is just the, the move, the transition point from, from Midian back to Egypt. Again, he's sewn together six different pieces of information. And the first is Moses asks for his father-in-law Jethro's blessing. So let's go old school and stand out of reverence for God's Word as Chris reads for us this morning. And he'll begin with verse 18. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Okay, now, uh, in this next little piece of cloth, Moses leaves Midian, but he also gives us some, he backfills some information that we didn't have before about his conversation with God. Okay? Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Okay, again, more backfill information. We're going to find out here in verses 21 through 23 uh, something pre pretty uh, extraordinary that God told Moses uh, in his dialogue, in that exchange with him, that kind of he, he sort of gives him what's going to happen through this whole uh, interchange between he and Pharaoh. Okay. The Lord said to Moses, "When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says: Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go, so he may worship me." But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. This next little piece of cloth is, I mean, look, this is in the top 20 at least of strange stories in the Bible. Uh, we'll give you some explanation for it, but we're not going to be able to fully unpack this for you. This is, this is Zipporah, Moses' wife. She ends up circumcising their son, Gershon. Here it is. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Just made all the men here feel very uncomfortable. Okay, in this next paragraph, this is Aaron and Moses' reunion. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. So don't snooze on this last paragraph. This is uh, when, they, when they actually have the conversation with Israelite leaders. There, there is a revival. There's a spiritual renewal that happens here. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Father, we pray that you will open up this uh, passage to us this morning, and especially that you will speak into the profound... Uh, profound, perspective-changing, worldview-changing, life-altering 
uh, theological and philosophical truth that spills out of this. You know, soften our hearts to this, and, and uh, we pray that we would live in light of this truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. What in the world is going on in this passage, and what does it mean? Okay, in terms of the overall story arc, the important fact here is that God's reluctant prophet, God's reluctant sp- spokesperson, has finally decided to answer God's call and return to Egypt. So that, in terms of the big story, that's what you need to know. This wasn't the only time God had called someone to a task that seemed unworkable to them. I think of Jonah and Jeremiah, for example, from the Old Testament, both Old Testament prophets, and both of them rejected God's assignment, but both of them ultimately relented and did what God asked them to do. The same is true for Moses. Now, it's certainly not always the pattern that God calls us to something that we don't want to do, but uh, that's also definitely not unheard of. And yet today we read about Moses, how he returned to Egypt to exactly what and exactly where God wanted him. Here's the thing. If you miss everything else, don't miss this. It's right up front, here's the walk away principle for us today. God's purposes are always served. God's purposes are always served. I want you to hear uh, this summary, and a special apology to those of you who are uh, watching from home. This is a quote from one of the commentaries that I've been using through these conversations. This comes from Dr. Philip Ryken, and he said this, and I want you to see this. From beginning to end, the entire exodus was the result of God's sovereign decree. The whole agonizing and then exhilarating experience of slavery and freedom was part of His perfect will. It was God's will to bring His people out of Egypt. It was also His good pleasure to keep them there as long as He did. Which is proved by His hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Peter Enns writes, The deliverance of Israel from Egypt is entirely God's doing and under His complete control. The impending exodus is a play in which God is author, producer, director, and principal actor. Even when Pharaoh took his turn on stage, God received all the applause. Like like everything else that God has ever done, the exodus was all for His glory. From beginning to end, the exodus was the result of God's sovereign decree. God's will is always served. And this is proven true throughout the whole story of the exodus. We're going to revisit this theme in our times of journeying through this book, but we see it especially through today's passage. Now, as a writer and storyteller, as I said, Moses wanted to get us from Midian to Egypt as quickly as possible because Egypt is where the real action takes place. But by reducing that transition time to just its highlights, he ends up highlighting the purposes of God for us in several key ways. The first way we see the fulfillment of God's purposes highlighted is in the simple fact that Moses returned. If if you were here last week for our conversation uh, through this, the first part of Exodus 4, you'll remember (laughs) he didn't really want to do this. But he ended up returning. Of course, when he returned, Moses wasn't exactly the returning hero in Egypt. We don't know how much anyone back in Egypt even knew about him during these years. He certainly wasn't completely unknown. Aaron, his brother, was evidently a leader in the community at large, and Aaron knew where Moses was. Aaron probably knew something of the the kind of life Moses had been living. Aaron was even on his way to meet with Moses when when Moses had his encounter with God. But, But Moses had been away from Egypt for a generation. While there may have been stories circulating in the community about you know, the Jewish child who uh, was raised in Pharaoh's court and then who had to flee as a, as a wanted criminal from Egypt. I doubt that anyone in Egypt knew very much about him, and I doubt that he was on the front of anybody's mind during this whole period. As I said, Moses' return would not have been the return of the great hero. And yet, he returned. And it's clear that the move here from Midian to Egypt from Midian to Egypt, is permanent in Moses' mind. This is a big part of why he needed his father-in-law's blessing. He was moving, and he was taking Jethro's daughter and his grandsons with him. So it's pretty clear 
also that Moses intended to return as an Israelite and not as an Egyptian prince. Remember verse 18? He said, let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see who might be alive. This is what he said to Jethro. He's returning as an Israelite. So Jethro gave his blessing, and Moses packed up his family and left. And here we find out in verse 19 that the people wanted Moses killed, the people who wanted Moses killed, at that point were all dead themselves. This was a signal that it was safe for Moses to return. You see, it was common practice in the ancient world, as it is sometimes in the modern world, for a new government to cancel criminal penalties imposed by the previous government. Usually they would grant uh, like a general amnesty to prisoners and to those who were sought by the law. So Moses had every reason to believe that his return to Egypt would not involve the death penalty. In summary, the reluctant prophet moved, according to God's purposes, back to the place of his birth to do, reluctantly, God's will. God's purposes are always served. And at that point in the narrative, verses 21 through 23 now, Moses inserted some detail from his earlier encounter with God that he hadn't covered before, and it's a doozy. So I want you to look at this, verses 21 through 23. See that on the screen. Essentially, God had given Moses the outline of what was going to happen when Moses talked to Pharaoh, including the dynamic conclusion when the Lord would put to death the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. And as you look at these verses... I want you to think back to that quote I cited earlier from Dr. Riken about God as author, producer, director, and principal actor. You see that? This is our second giant indication that God's purposes are always served. In these verses, God is directing one of His main actors by giving them a hint at where the story will eventually go since God is also obviously the author of the story. God's purposes are always served. And look at the end of verse 21 at that uncomfortable little phrase. This detail gives us a third and very specific proof that God's purposes are always served. And do you see it? And now I know some of us don't snooze on this. I know some of us are uncomfortable with the idea that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Over the years I've been asked many times, what does that really mean, Ed? I mean, if you get back to the actual Hebrew, what does it mean? I want you to know, first of all, I know very little Hebrew. I know enough to look things up, and I know where and how to do so. But I do know that if you get back to the actual Hebrew of this verse, what it means is that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I know, of course, that when someone asks that question, what they're really asking is, surely it can't mean what it's saying. But it does. In fact, this idea is repeated over 20 times in the book of Exodus alone. In fairness, a couple of those instances, the suggestion is that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And there are a couple of instances that seem pretty neutral. It's, you, know, you don't really know how or who hardened his heart, but most of the time, God is the actor when this phrase is, phrase is used. I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go, God said in verse 21. So wait, did Pharaoh harden his own heart, or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And the answer is yes. And that answer has to eventually satisfy us, because that's the truth. That's, that's how reality works. There have been times in my own thinking when I've wondered how that could be fair. And I've wondered what it really means for Pharaoh to harden his heart if we allow that God hardened his heart. I mean, if God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then what did Pharaoh's choice to harden his heart even mean? Did he even have a real choice? But I eventually have to recognize that there are things about the way reality works that are above my pay grade. Now, I'm not saying that to cheat the answer this morning. That's not just a, oh, just trust God and stop asking that question kind of answer. And we'll have more to say about this in future installments. We'll give more explanation about this as we journey through this book. I promise, because as I said, this phrase reappears several times. And and there's more for us to say. The Apostle Paul uses this as one of his arguments in the New Testament. There's more explanation to offer about God's control of things versus our free will. But for today, let's remind ourselves that God's purposes are always served. That's the point here. 
And one of the reasons we struggle with this idea, and we do, we do sometimes struggle with this. And one of the reasons that we struggle with this kind of idea, I think, is because we imagine, please don't miss this, we imagine that God is just a bigger, better version of ourselves. And these verses here, these strange little accounts that have been sewn together, should disabuse us of that idea completely. God is not just a better version of us. He is altogether different from us. In fact, the Bible frequently refers to God as holy. And that word holy means, first of all, other than, or different from, or set apart. God is other than we are, and His purposes are always served. Now, at the very end of today, I'm going to apply that, sort of, and I'm going to talk about what that looks like, sort of. This is why, this whole idea is why the Apostle Paul said in the New Testament, in Him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. God's purposes are always served. Now with the next paragraph, Moses abruptly moves to a truly strange account of the circumcision of his own son. This is going to get uncomfortable, but we're going to talk about it. If you are confused by this story, you need to know everyone is. There have been many, many trees killed to create the paper for people to offer explanations of what they think this uh, little paragraph means. I've read a bunch about it, and it's still not perfectly clear to me, but, but let me give you seven helpful hints, and then I'll tell you what I think the big picture meaning is. So here are seven helpful hints as you look at this little paragraph. Number one helpful hint, circumcision was a big deal in God's mind. Look, for, for ancient peoples, there, was always a, there, was, there were physical indications that you were a slave or that you were a servant of someone. There, it might be branding, or it might be uh, some kind of earring or, or, or a, a neck ring. Well, I think God was using that idea because they understood that principle. And He established circumcision as the physical indicator that His people belonged to Him. It was a big deal. Now, the Jews weren't the only people to practice circumcision. In fact, the Midianites, Jethro and his daughter and their family, they also practiced circumcision. So there wasn't anything magical about circumcision itself. The point wasn't circumcision. The point was obedience. Second helpful hint. Moses had not obeyed. Moses had not circumcised his own son. He was moving to Egypt to undertake this great assignment that God had given him but he had not obeyed in this important matter. He was stepping into God's great purposes, but his own house was not in order. Third helpful hint. Verse 24, as, as we read it in, in the New International Version, it's, it reads, At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Strange, I know. You need to know that the Moses there is an interpretation by the translators. And they rarely do that. In the Hebrew, it simply says him. And, and some scholars believe that the him is Gershom, Moses' oldest son, and that God intended, intended to kill the son and not Moses. I'm not going to argue either way. The people who translated the NIV are much smarter than I am. And so at the very least, I'm going to suspend any questions I have. But just, just so you know, there's some confusion built into the text itself. So what exactly is Zipporah, Moses' wife, doing here? And what does it mean? Okay, fourth helpful hint. Zipporah was performing a, a circumcision on her son. That's what happens. This was something of an emergency procedure because she was evidently aware that God was angry and that He was going to kill either the son or Moses himself. So she cut off the foreskin of her son. Awkward. Fifth uh, helpful hint. After the circumcision, she performed what seems to be some kind of ritual that was meaningful to her, meaningful maybe to the Midianites. She thought it would be meaningful to God. The NIV leads you to believe that she touched Moses' feet with the removed skin. Strange. Okay, first of all, the Moses here in verse 25 is again just him in the Hebrew. So it may have been Gershom that she touched with the foreskin. 
The sixth helpful hint, uh, you should know that the word feet here, third time apologies, the word feet here is the Hebrew word regalim. It's one of several Hebrew euphemisms for genitals. Uh, by the way, other euphemisms are hand, knees, and stones. You can find these euphemisms in, in Isaiah 6, 2, Isaiah 7, 20, Ezekiel 16, 25, Deuteronomy 28, 57, and many other places. All of this means that Zipporah performed the circumcision and that she followed the circumcision with some kind of ritual in an attempt to obey God and to prevent him from killing either her husband or her son. And then she said some ritualized words that she must have hoped you know, would, would satisfy, or maybe it was just part of the ceremony. According to our translation, she says, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So seventh helpful hint, the word bridegroom here is the Hebrew word hatan. I know that you came this morning looking for all these details about this weird passage and, and uh, uh, lecture in the Hebrew language. She was almost definitely, though, not speaking about Moses here, bridegroom. This word can mean bridegroom, but it, can, but it had been many, many years since she and Moses had been married, so it doesn't make sense really for her to have been talking about Moses as her bridegroom. The word can simply also mean relative. If she'd been referring somehow to her husband, she might have used the Hebrew word ish, which is the word for husband. Uh, so what she probably said here was probably something like, you are now a blood relative to me. And by the way, I saw this explanation from more than one source, and one of the sources I saw it from was one of the people who helped translate the NIV. So I don't know why it doesn't read that way. But I feel pretty good about that idea anyway. I realized all of this is about as clear as mud. But here's the point. This is a big deal to God. He was going to end this mission. He was going to kill Moses, or perhaps Moses' son, because of this disobedience. And this is the part not to miss. This is another reminder that God is not just a bigger, better, nicer version of us. He is not to be trifled with. God's purposes are always served. And when God's will or God's purposes are at stake, God is exacting. He's, he's just. He's holy. He's mysterious. And He's terrifying. We have domesticated God in our thinking, I'm afraid. We've put Him in a box and we've made Him small and He is not. I think we do that. I think we, we, we make God small. For example, when we demand that everything work out the way we're sure that it should. I mean, we get, we get when things, hard, things that are hard happen, or we get it when we have to sacrifice in order to get good things. We, we get that. That makes sense to us. But when terrible things happen, that in our minds shouldn't, what, God? Wait, Why? We're sure that if it doesn't make sense to us, it can't be right. And we put God in a box when we presume He'll forgive us. We continue to sin, and we presume that He'll be okay with it, ultimately because we're really sorry, and a nice guy would be okay if we were really sorry. God is holy and just and mysterious and terrifying. And sometimes when we're around God, weird things happen unexplainable things happen. Sometimes hard things happen. God's purposes will always be served, sometimes down to the minute details. And our obedience or our hardening is a part of that. All right, we're going to land this plane in a way that I think wakes you up in a moment, but let's get through this. The next piece that gets woven into this tapestry here at the end of chapter 4 is Moses' reunion with his brother Aaron. And the final piece covers that, that spiritual renewal of the Israelites when they hear Moses' and Aaron's account. We don't have time to offer up much detail uh, about either of these except a couple of observations. First of all, we can't miss the fact, the reunion between Moses and Aaron, we can't miss the fact that at exactly the time Moses was experiencing God through the burning yet not consumed bush, Aaron was already on his way to visit Moses. And in this section, 
we learn that this wasn't just a casual family visit. Verse 27 tells us that God told Aaron to go into the desert to meet Moses. God arranged this. In other words, here again, God is director, author, producer, principal, actor, working out all things for His purposes. God's purpose is always served. Final observation. When Moses shared his experience and his calling with the, the leaders of the Israelite community, they experienced a profound spiritual renewal. One of the commentaries that I look at called it a mass conversion, and legitimately so. A conversion. According to verse 30, after Aaron offered some validating introductory remarks, then Moses, quote, performed the signs before the people and they believed. Then the text says this, And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped Him. We're going to make a deal about that in just a second. Did you know that the NIV translation, and that's the one we usually use on Sunday mornings here at Gateway, they don't translate the name Yahweh with I Am. That's what it technically means. Nor do they write out the name Yahweh. When they use Yahweh in the Old Testament, what the NIV does with it is it capitalizes all of the letters. Now there was a generic word for Lord. And when that word is used in the Old Testament, the NIV has capital L, then all lowercase. But when the name Yahweh is used, it's capital L and then small capital O-R-D. This, verse 31, is the first time the Jews have recognized who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob really is. This is the first time they use His name. And this is the first time they are certain that He still cares for them, that He is their God, so they bow down in worship. And that's the right response. All right, let's land this plane. Uh, For me, this raises two questions. The first question is, so what? How do... How do we even think about this? And how does this affect our lives? The second question is going to be, practically, what does it look like? But first of all, how do we think about this? How does this affect our lives, this big idea, Ed? Well, for one thing, when we say that God's purposes are always served, that means that our lives are not random. We are part of a bigger story. God's story. And you and I are either working within that story and our lives are conjoined to that story and we're submitted to that story or we struggle against that story. And the end point of that struggle is not a good place because God's purposes are always served. So when we're struggling against the purposes of God, it does not go well for us, ultimately. Plus, this great truth creates some some wonderful things for us and in us. It creates freedom for us. We know that God will have His way in us and through us. So random events, even negative events in our lives, they don't derail God's purposes. We can live freely because of that. And maybe more importantly, this truth creates in us, produces in us humility. We are not in control. God is. So we walk humbly and we hold our lives loosely. That's why when terrible things happen, we don't tell one another, listen to this, when terrible things happen, we don't tell one another, oh, you know, God planned this because God's purposes are always served. We don't think that and we don't tell one another that. God is just and holy and terrifying. It's true. But He's also kind and merciful and good. And we treat ourselves and one another the same way Jesus treated us. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. In other words, we walk with one another and with ourselves and we don't evaluate and we don't even try to explain our sorrow. We we are too humbled for that. We simply allow God to walk through it with us. We leave the rest up to His mysterious sovereignty. We don't have all the answers and we know we never will. Finally, what does this look like? Really, what is the... What's the application? Look, sometimes on Sunday morning, uh, the, the Scripture presents for us awesome and profound application. 
You know, this is what it says here, and so now we can go do it, and here's how. But I want you to know, this passage of Scripture and this principle does not admit to that. God's purposes are always served, and, and the conclusion for us is, how do we become people whose purposes are always served? Now, this is not for us. This is for Him only. You know what this looks like? This looks like Jesus. This doesn't look like us. I'm reminded of, uh, some of you have been around Gateway for a while, you know this, you've heard me say this before, but one of my favorite stories in the Bible, certainly one of my favorite Jesus stories, is a time when uh, Jesus is, is in the boat with the disciples, and a storm, the Sea of Galilee, and a storm comes up. And these are, these are Galilean fishermen. They know the storms of the Sea of Galilee. They, they have had friends and even relatives who have been killed by these storms. They're terrified. Jesus is asleep. They're terrified by the storm. And they go over and they wake Jesus up. And Jesus, aren't you concerned? Help us. And Jesus comes to the front of the ship. And I'm imagining Jesus raising His arms. And He says, Quiet! And the sea gets completely still. Here's what's incredible about that story. Uh, the, the, the accounts, the Gospel accounts, make it clear that the disciples were very, very afraid. They thought they were going to lose their lives in the storm. They run over to wake Jesus up. Jesus walks up and He quiets the storm. And then one of the accounts says they're terrified. They're more afraid after Jesus calmed the storm than they were before. And then I think it's Matthew's account says that the disciples look at one, of, one another and one of them says, what kind of man is this? Because you see, they, they, they know Jesus is a profound teacher. They've never heard anyone teach like Him before, but they've got a category for teacher. And they know Jesus is a healer and they've seen other people heal. They've never seen anyone like, heal like Him before, but they've got a category for healer. But they've got no category for this! What is this? You know what it is? It's holiness with skin on. It is the Son of God. That's the application. This looks like Jesus. This doesn't look like us. And our, our response to this is not to figure out how to be people who can make our purposes served. Our response is to fall down and worship. Just like the Israelites did. From beginning to end, the entire exodus was a result of God's sovereign decree. The whole agonizing and then exhilarating experience of slavery and freedom was part of His perfect will. It was God's will to bring His people out of Egypt. It was also His good pleasure to keep them there as long as He did, which is proved by His hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Peter Enns writes, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt is entirely God's doing and under His complete control. The impending exodus is a play in which God is author, producer, director, and principal actor. Even when Pharaoh took his turn on the stage, God received all the applause like everything else that God has ever done. The exodus was all for His glory. I'm going to ask the worship team if they'd come. Let's pray. So Lord, this morning, um, we still our hearts and we bow down and worship. That is the only response that we can give to something that we cannot understand. It's too big for us. You are too big for us. And yet you've made yourself known to us and you want to be in relationship with us. So we, we draw near to you. It gives new meaning when we read the New Testament authors say we draw near to you boldly because how could we come to you boldly? <laughs> but we do so because of what Jesus has done for us. So this morning, great God Almighty, we come to you boldly. We bring our needs we bring our, our desires. We bring our hearts, our minds, our bodies before you. And we worship.
In Jesus' name. Would you stand? We're going to sing that song, Canvas and Clay. finished with me you're not finished with me yet. you're not finished with me you're not finished with me yet. you're not finished with me you're not finished with me yet. you're not finished with me no you're not finished with me yet. So when I doubt it Lord remind me how wonderful you made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay And for my goodness, you may all things work together for your glory. And for your name, Father. We're not dead, you're still working. You know you're working even when we can't see it, even when we can't understand it. There's so much mystery behind your ways and what you do, yet you call us to know you. Us to seek you. So I pray through our deserts, through our storms, we'd never stop that pursuit of you because we know that you'll never stop pursuing us. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey Gateway, it's Pete again. Time for a few announcements. Easter and Holy Week are coming up and here's what's happening. First, we'll be releasing short Holy Week video devotionals every day of Holy Week, beginning next weekend. These will be a good way to reflect on the events of Jesus' life before his resurrection. Stay tuned for those and we pray that these quick devotionals can be meaningful for you. Next is our Good Friday event happening on Friday, April 15th. Gateway is doing something different for Good Friday this year. We'll be having a Passover Seder experience as part of the evening. Passover is a celebration of Moses leading God's people out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. Passover points to Jesus as the Lamb of God and our Savior. We will have a traditional Passover service as well as taste the food that is typically served at a Seder. This event is designed for both adults and children, five and above, Registration is required as space is limited, so please register online at mygateway.life. After Good Friday, we'll be celebrating Easter as a whole community, so join us on Easter Sunday at 9 or 11 a.m. And for Easter only, we will have Kids Town for all ages at both 9 and 11 a.m. services. There are some special things happening for your kids, but I was told to keep it a surprise, so definitely plan to join us for this special Sunday. 
Now, speaking of Easter activities, have you ever been egged? You can imagine that that wouldn't be a very pleasant experience, but we're gonna put a twist on that. We have an Easter outreach project for you and your family. Starting today, you can pick up a You've Been Egged kit in the lobby to hide Easter eggs in your friends' or neighbors' yards, along with a great reminder of why we celebrate Easter. Anyone can pick up a kit today, and we can't wait to hear all about the fun. As we wrap up, here are some more events coming up at Gateway, including our Around the World Brunch, our Couples Weekend, and an upcoming bike, bike drive. Check them out on mygateway.life where you can register for any of these events. Thanks for joining us today, Gateway, and we can't wait to see you next Sunday when Holy Week begins. Go in peace. Thank you.